uh, fixture design for random vibration and for shock. Turns out design of fixtures that are used in random vibration tests is basically no easier or difficult than sign. Uh, then the reason that we've been poking at sign is sign is easier to understand. Um, I was watching uh, one of the uh, one of the graduate students uh, was evaluating some of his tooling on a fixture, and he was evaluating it by just hitting it with with noise and using that to evaluate the system. Now, in theory, that's not too bad. So. Basically, what he's doing um, input, for instance, a flat spectrum like that, so input a flat spectrum and then measure the response and you might get something like that. So these would be your resonant peaks. So it's possible to do fixture evaluation with noise, but you don't really understand exactly what's going on. They could be interactions of other things because all frequencies are present simultaneously. That's one of the reasons we use sign, is you know exactly what's going on and what to poke at. Uh, but in general, a fixture that works for random will generally work for sign. Okay. Provide damping. Okay, everything that we've said. And yes, you can, uh, I think this was in the random vibration chapter, as a matter of fact. Uh, if you measure the response power spectral density, compare it to the input power spectral density in G squared per hertz, Take the square root, that'll get you the transmissibility. Uh, now shock fixtures, uh, now we talked a little bit about shock testing, but for the most part, uh, the goal of shock testing is to screen good things from bad things. The, the big difference is that you apply a single event or a transient rather than continuous excitation. We looked at different types of shock test machines. The whole idea with a shock test machine is that you store energy and deliver it in a controlled way. You can use the acceleration due to gravity, you can use compressed springs, uh, you can use a shaker that uses an electrodynamic force to generate that pulse. So a lot of different ways of doing it. Now shock test fixtures are a little easier to design than random vibration fixtures. Uh, a lot of times because they don't say what the dynamic requirements are. Um, and in general, a fixture that works for vibration will be good for shock testing, but a shock fixture may not be good for vibration testing. The reason is, and I'll get to the statement down at the bottom, uh, the reason that that's the case. Uh, now, you can pretty much uh, make fixtures that are used on free fall uh, drop machines uh, stiff enough to pass the energy to the device. That's all you really want. You want a fixture that will deliver that energy to the device. Uh, and keep in mind what a shock pulse looks like. It's pretty much just a half sign. It's normally the one of the most common shock pulses, a half sign. Trying to get a half sign through the fixture shouldn't be all that hard. Uh, and you can figure out, so if um, time and amplitude, so if this is your half sign pulse, and it has a certain period associated with it, you can figure out what frequency that is. So just take that and extend it, sorry about that, extend it down and through, and basically two times that period will give you the frequency that you're inputting, and use that as the frequency that you want to design your fixture to. Normally this frequency is reasonably low. And, so as we talked about in shock, that a structure subjected to shock responds under forced and free vibration. So you have your, your, your fixture that transmits this frequency well, then all it really has to do is to support the lightly damped ringing 
that normally won't damage the fixture. So even if your it won't damage the device. So even if your fixture rings after you hit it with that pulse, that's generally at a very high frequency and it doesn't damage the device because the device can't generally respond to it because it's so hot. 